spend our time talking about what you might do were you to be elected, and your business is the National Health Service. Um, let's start with what you told the Times last week. You said, I don't think it's good enough that the NHS uses every winter crisis and every challenge it faces as an excuse to ask for more money. Waiting lists at nearly 8 million, ambulances stacked up for hours outside A&E. Seriously? An excuse? It's, it's an astonishing record of failure from no, 13 years... No, 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 no. Let's deal with your government. words. Let's not but get Trevor, back on how terrible Tories no, are. I'll, I'll tell you... You said, don't use this as an excuse. Seriously, are you calling that an excuse? I think that when you look at the challenges facing the NHS, not just now but into the long term, we've got the triple whammy of a growing ageing society, rising chronic disease and rising cost pressures. And unless we keep a focus, a sharp focus on all three, we, we threaten to not just overwhelm the NHS in terms of demand, but bankrupt the NHS financially. And, we, and what I've been setting out is a, the case for both investment and reform, because pouring ever-increasing amounts of taxpayers' money into a broken system is wasteful in every sense. It's a waste of money we don't have. It's a waste of time that isn't on the NHS's side. And it's a waste of potential, because I believe, uh, from the bottom of my heart, that the NHS as a public service, free at the point of use, can exist for the next 75 years. Yeah, I but we've got to modernise and change in order for it to be sustainable in the longer term. Yeah, we've had this conversation before, but I, I, I really want to address what you've been saying. And, I, you know, it's not a criticism, it's your words. You said uh, also in that uh, same interview you want to shake the NHS and the public out of complacency. Uh, we've been reporting on Sky News this week on the uh, NHS. Um, can we have a camera there next time you tell a nurse who's come off a 12-hour shift that she's complacent. Hey, I'm not saying that, that people working in the NHS are complacent. In fact, I'm amplifying their, their anxieties, their experiences no, of work. No, you're not. You're saying that, hang on, the Trevor, NHS is finish. complacent. That's a ridiculous thing to say. Your words. I've, I've sat in GP surgeries, literally looking over GPs' shoulders as they show me their outdated IT systems and the ridiculous amounts of red tape and accountability measures that they are subjected to, which waste their time that they would rather spend dealing with patients. I've spoken to those nurses and ward staff who are dealing with creaking bureaucracy you and didn't outdated say to them, systems you're that, being hold complacent them, that hold them back. By but there is, there is a... No, the there is a you didn't of course, say no that, one, did I'm, you? I've been complaining about the NHS crisis. It's in its worst state in history, but I'm also saying, especially at a time when the public finances are in a total mess because of 13 years of conservative mismanagement, that, you know, firstly, there isn't a great deal of money to go around and we can't be complacent about that. And I think there is a complacency that assumes that we can just Who, turn the taps when on. When you say there is a complacency, put that in active terms. Who's being complacent? Well, you only need to look um, at the reaction to what I said in the Sunday Times, that there are plenty of people who believe that the answer to the NHS crisis is simply Which more money. Which people? And look, if you... If Which you, people? Well, I mean, you, I'm surprised you haven't confronted with my social media mentions. They went into meltdown after no, the Sunday on, time. Come on, But Who look, are you talking about? I'm talk if what you want to say is, look, there are doctors or there are managers, I want to say that. Well, I think it's a general complacency. I think it's a general complacency about the NHS, its sustainability and its future. And what I've been setting out over the last two years as Shadow Health and Care Secretary are, yes, proposals for investment, fully costed and fully funded, but also linked to reform. For example, the two million more appointments that we would deliver at evenings and weekends to cut the backlog. Uh, yes, more appointments, but also the NHS working more efficiently and effectively, as they did at Guy's and St Thomas's. That was on the front page of The Times this week. But we need to see that sort of approach everywhere. When right. I talk about mental health support in every school and community mental health hubs in every community, a fully costed, fully funded policy. Yes, that's about additional investment for new services, but it's also reducing demand on general practice and keeping people out of A&E. Right. So right. there will be investment with Labour, but it's got to be linked to reform. And I am worried about the complacency okay. that against the backdrop of 
appalling public finances, people assume that an incoming Labour government will just be able to turn the taps on. Even if Rachel right. Rees had a complete personality transplant and became a big spending chancellor, she might turn the tap on, but there'd be nothing in the tank. So we've got to be honest about the fact the public finances are in a mess. We've got to get a grip on that. That's why Labour's All priority right. is going let's, for growth. Well, but the answer to the NHS isn't just more money, it's investment and reform that delivers results. Well, let's talk about the kind of reforms that you might have in mind. You recently visited a high-performing hospital in Singapore. You said you want our hospitals to be more like that with advanced technology, patient-centred approach, all that. Two-thirds of healthcare spending in Singapore is private money, because that's even more private sector involvement than in the United States. If you're in Singapore, there are five classes of care. You can buy better room and so on, A, B, C and so on. Is that what you want the NHS to become? No, I'm, I'm fully committed to the NHS as a public service free at the point of use. And whether it's Singapore, Australia, where I was recently, um, continental Europe, I, I don't think the problem with the NHS in our country is that it's free at the point of use and publicly funded. It's not the model of funding that's a problem, it's where the money goes. Because when you compare the NHS to other OECD countries, we're pretty much top of the charts in terms of hospital spending, but when it comes to primary care, community services, mental health, diagnostics, we're either near the bottom, at the bottom, so, or so seriously our, our lagging money, behind. We've got enough money, but we're spending it in the wrong places. In the wrong places. So, for example, there are now 2,000 fewer GPs. Those smaller number of GPs are providing a million more appointments than they were during before the pandemic, but people still struggle to get a GP appointment. So instead of going to see a GP which costs the NHS 40 quid, they often end up in A&E which costs £400. So that's why I say to the NHS and make the case to the public about Labour's reform agenda, it's not okay. just about more money, it's about where the money goes to get better outcomes for patients and better value for taxpayers' money. Well. One way that they get better value in Singapore is um, low-paid labour. A third of the Singapore workforce consists of low-paid Chinese, Filipino and Malaysian immigrant workers. The equivalent here would be to have 25 million immigrant workers. Now, your party wants a number of immigrants down and pay up. How are you going to square that circle? If you want to copy any part of that model, you're going to have to do something like that. Well, we have an over-reliance on overseas workers working in our health and care system, and that's challenging for two reasons. One is we've got a global shortage of health and care workers, so we can't assume that that pool of talent will always be there to draw from. And secondly, the UK is recruiting from red list countries, countries identified by the World Health Organisation as having a serious shortfall of their own, so I think that's immoral. We've got to invest in training our own homegrown talent. That's okay. why we're committed to double the number of medical school places, so we're not turning away thousands of straight-A students, but we've also got to okay. improve the pay of care workers so we can recruit and retain those brilliant care professionals who are crucial for the future of meeting the challenges okay. of growing ageing society, okay. rising okay. chronic disease and, and rising cost pressures. One last uh, question, which is not um, about the health service, not even really political. Um, uh, on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being utter devastation. Um, how disappointed are you that Tony Blair says he won't do a David Cameron and come back into government? <laughs> um, look, unlike David Cameron, Tony Blair doesn't have to return to government to try and rebuild um, his reputation. David Cameron, I, I think, had a disastrous legacy as, as Prime Minister. Oh, come um, on. And um, Wouldn't it be good to have Tony back round the cabinet table? We, I we, mean, he's your kind of we can, guy on we the, can, we can, in the Labour Party. We can call on Tony's advice any time we like, and we often do, but um, it's no surprise to any of us that he doesn't fancy returning to the House of Lords and returning to Parliament. Well, Stuiting, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.